I promised you in my last iPhone 15 Pro Max buying guide to follow up with some options for people who may be considering switching from Android to Apple and in this video I'm going to try and convince you that that's a bad idea. Just kidding, I'll try to help you as well with your decision even if you already switched or perhaps you're not switching at all, you're just buying a new iPhone, right? You will have five things to consider in this video which will make that purchase or transition a little bit easier. I'm Alex and I do down to earth tech videos. By the way, that last video, what a rocket that was. Can you believe we were trending on YouTube? Crazy, right? From my tiny little channel here to be trending, just surreal and thank you. But how not to start with the ecosystem? This is the single most painful aspect of switching and I've done the switch a couple of times from iPhone to Android and if you know the channel, you know that, you know, I wasn't pretending that was proper switching. And right now I'm actually in the middle of it, right? I have switched about six months ago. And my Apple Watch Ultra stopped working because there's nothing for it to sync with, right? It's proper, like cold turkey. I'm done with it. <laughs> it's, but I also did the inverse a few years ago, going from Android back to iPhone. And in both cases, the pain was in the ecosystem. At least most of the issues were like dealing with iMessage and family and friends, right? When you move from Android to Apple, all your other friends who are on Android, they're gonna hate you because they'll show up as green bubbles on your iPhone. The best way around it, to be honest, is to use third-party messaging apps. In fact, and I still maintain that WhatsApp and Telegram provide a richer experience anyway. So if you trust their encryption, you know, we know WhatsApp and Facebook go hand in hand, so we can't ignore that. But I do believe that these third-party apps, you know, there are others as well, they make the green bubble versus the blue bubble thing, you know, a bit weaker. The argument kind of disappears for me. Another aspect of the ecosystem is the interaction between the iPhone and other devices, right? It's a slippery slope because you might feel inclined to buy even more Apple products, right? Because of that interaction. You want your AirPods Max, you want your AirPods Pro, your iPads, your AirTags, you know. As an Android user, you're gonna lose nearby share, but you're gonna get AirDrop, which is fantastic. But the Apple ecosystem, is not as smooth as everyone says. That music handoff doesn't always work. Siri gets really confused. I mean, horrendously confused. It's far from perfect. And don't get me started on AirTags. It keeps telling me I left stuff behind when I'm like, my bag is right here. I can see the thing, you know, I haven't left it behind. And you get these pop-ups on your iPhone. But, and Android fans, you are gonna disagree with me on this, I know. But I still think the Apple ecosystem is more fluid. It feels friendlier to me. When it works, FaceTime, using continuity camera on the MacBook Pro, you know, with your, with your iPhone, you know, your watch notifications is coming in. Everything, when it works, is fantastic. What I'm trying to say is, in summary, don't underestimate the ecosystem aspect. Now, another aspect that you can't ignore is performance on these devices. But this is something that is becoming, for me anyway, less and less important. You know, Apple has just released the iPhone with the new A17 Pro chip, a three nanometer chip, which is incredible, right? My 15 Pro Max arrives in a few days, but we can see already, right, from the reviews out there and from what Apple has shown, that they are gonna challenge, you know, the top devices out there, like the S23 Ultra. But for me, performance has to be matched to what you do, you know, what you can do on a smartphone. Having an amazing chip doesn't necessarily translate it to being noticeably faster or more useful. Apple can't stop mentioning machine learning algorithms, right? They say that a lot. But where do we see that in practice? I'll show you here in a minute a great example of how Android, for example, makes use of its processor, but also AI and machine learning. In talking about machine learning, this and many other skills can be learned with Skillshare. Being a long-term Skillshare user myself and teacher, I really value the ability to explore new skills, experiment with new classes, and overall become a better professional. In my case, I've been learning new skills that surround content creation recently. This is something that three years ago, I had no clue about. So I took classes on camera gear, video editing, but also on business management and marketing and productivity. If you've been following the channel, you can probably see the progress I made, and I can 100% guarantee that without these skills that I picked up using Skillshare, I would still be struggling in many areas. Now that I've acquired some skills myself and I have my own style, I feel a little bit more relaxed in front of the camera. I use the Skillshare platform to teach and I will be publishing my first course in there by the end of the year. I think it's fantastic how Skillshare courses cover so many areas, whether you want to learn how to paint, design a website, create content or start your own business, Skillshare will have a class for you from beginner to pro. 
To give an idea, there are awesome classes on AI and machine learning that are now becoming such an important skill to learn. Here are just a handful of the AI and productivity classes that I think are a must. And the best part of this, if you want to learn something new or level up your skills, Skillshare is giving the first 1,000 viewers a one month free trial when you use my link in the description. And if you're watching this from a TV, feel free to pause the video here and scan the QR code as well. And thanks so much Skillshare for making this video possible. But Android devices have been using AI and machine learning recently in really practical ways that make a big difference to my day to day. The Google Pixel here, for example, since the 6 Pro, I noticed that this was the best uh, speech to text recognition on any device. The Pixel 6 Pro and the 7 Pro after that were the first smartphones that made me realize that these actually can be used as a proper assistant. It understands me and I've got a dodgy accent, as you can probably tell, right? Siri and Bixby, I'm sorry, but those two are nowhere near, you know, what Google has been able to achieve with, with their Tensor chip. But I think where Apple always do well and will do well again is in computational photography. But let's not forget, this isn't news either, right? Apple themselves have been doing it. Android devices have been using computational photography really well too. So if you're trying to make a decision based on performance alone, think about the practical use of machine learning and AI and all those things. I know if you're a gamer, for example, right? Ray tracing and those things will be important to you. But if you're not interested in gaming, then that A17 Pro chip with ray tracing on hardware may not be that important to you. And something that you're not gonna hear many people say is this, Apple has only given us eight gig of memory on the iPhone 15. I think it's six gig even on the non-pro models. Why is that important though? Why is memory important? I think to me it comes down to longevity. These devices should be lasting three to five years, right? Not having enough memory now, it's probably okay because the apps and what we do with those devices, they're not gonna be hungry for more memory, but it kind of tells me that Apple has no plans to add more capable software on the iPhone anytime soon. And what do I mean by capable software? For instance, the iPhone could, have something like Samsung DeX. That would be awesome, right? It has a USB-C port now, right? I'm not sure it could run multiple displays, but at least one display at 4K. That's not out of question, I don't think. And it could also run multiple apps. Do you see where I'm going with this? A gig is not gonna get us very far, despite the A17 Pro being the best thing since sliced bread. And talking about displays, how about the displays, right? This is an easy one for me actually, because honestly, I don't think there will be a lot of difference between the top Android devices, like take the S23 Ultra for example, and the 15 Pro Max. I think the difference will become apparent when you look at two things. Uh, one is ergonomics, and the other one is immersiveness. I know, long, fancy words, but you know, the iPhone has an incredible display, and the, that was the case already with 13, 12, you know, 14. But for some reason, since last year, we've got this monkey island, and it's meant to show little stats and interact with certain apps, and kind of behave in ways you know, according to what you're doing. But in my experience, after five minutes, I just wish it wasn't there at all. You know, I'd much rather have as much screen real estate as possible. And I know this one is a kind of a preference thing, but I do like how the curved display just feels in the hand. You know, it's just much nicer. I have broken my S23 Ultra for full transparency. It, there's that issue as well, right? It's not the most resistant. If you drop it face down, even with a case, you're likely to damage it. I think I will like the iPhone 15 Pro Max more rounded edges. I think I've been complaining about the weight and how much it hurts my hand after a long time. But that Monkey Island, it hasn't been great on the 14 Pro Max for me. And I don't think it will be any different on the 15 Pro Max. I do know what Apple is trying to do here. I could be wrong, but they want people to know it's the new iPhone, right? Without the Monkey Island, the iPhone could be anything. Actually, it could be nothing. See what I did there? Now the big one, cameras. Since about September last year, I did use the 14 Pro Max as my main phone, and that had an amazing camera for photos and videos. Honestly, impeccable quality, you know, cannot complain, and I don't think I've ever said a bad word about 4K videos, photos, but recently, the S23 Ultra came out almost like out of nowhere because the S22 Ultra was crap before, you know, and to me, the S23 Ultra not only matched the iPhone, but bettered it in some situations. So I'm gonna be very surprised if the iPhone 15 Pro Max is able to challenge the S23 Ultra because from what we've seen in the events and the early reviews, it's not really looking anything like out of this world. It's only a few days away now for me and I do have a feeling that the output on the iPhone will be great. You know, the specs may not be that impressive. You know, there was a lot of talk about the periscope lens and we didn't get that on the iPhone and the zoom isn't as big as the zoom that we get on the S23 Ultra, for example. But Apple is doing some clever things with the stabilization, for example, and the Tetra Prism. But I'm actually really excited about that and I wanna see how that compares with other devices. The specs by themselves, though, don't really mean much, right? I've got a dummy device here, but you can guarantee that when I get the real thing, I will be taking them both out in the world for a proper spin, testing 4K videos, you know, point and shoot, ProRes, 
you know, this new ability to record into an external drive, you know, to really give you the best comparison possible. But right now, if the camera is the most important aspect to you coming from an Android to iPhone, I think you'll be more than fine. Apple can screw up many things, not on cameras. And talking about screwing up, if you're moving from Android to iOS, it's gonna be a bit of a shock to the system, right? I had a terrible experience with iOS 16, I gotta be honest, but I know it's more stable now and I know that iOS 17 does have some really cool new features, but coming from Android, you are gonna miss a couple of things. One is customization. By the way, before we delve into that, if you're enjoying this video, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps me getting the channel discovered out there. This video is a part two of three part series of the iPhone 15 buying guide series. There's a lot more coming up in this down to earth, not high pitched, yelling at you sort of, you know, tech review. I always put you first in my reviews and I don't have any ties with Apple or Samsung or any of these big brands, to be honest. So have a browse on the channel after this and if you like my stuff, it would be awesome if you subscribed. Okay, customization is now a bit friendlier than it used to be on the iPhones, but it's not gonna be like Android level customization. It's definitely positive to see this from Apple, right? That they're allowing you to change the look and feel of the iPhone much more than you used to, but don't expect that same granular level of detail that you'd get on an Android when it comes to customization. The other thing that you're gonna miss is multitasking. Can't really do multitasking on an iPhone unless what you mean by multitasking is just the ability to switch between apps really quickly. Especially if you're coming from Samsung, you're definitely gonna miss it. You know, having the ability to use multi-window or Samsung DeX, for example, it's just, you know, those things are not gimmicks anymore. For a lot of people, you now they use that on a day-to-day. -day. With Apple, the best you could do if that's important to you anyway, is to get an iPad, like an iPad mini even, right? In the current climate, it's quite hard to recommend getting two devices to do the job of one. But here, you get 300 videos for the price of one. You can find them here or here, and I hope to see you soon.